we've been alluding to some situations about where we're vulnerable. We talked about the airplane upset. And I want to give you a perspective on the airplane upset and what that is and, and what it looks to, like to us as pilots. So let's take a look. What this chart represents here is called the 100% all attitude environment. Okay, so what it means is the top of that chart is the airplane is 90 degrees nose up and the bottom of the chart is 90 degrees nose low. Okay, the left and right side of the chart can be 180 degrees of bank to the left, 180 degree bank to the right. Okay, so any airplane, any day, yes, even including fly-by-wire, flight envelope protected airplanes, okay, in degraded modes, can get to any situation, any combination of pitch and bank as shown in this diagram. That's a potential area that any airplane can go any day. Now, remember we talked about the airplane upset? It was as little as 25 degrees nose up, 10 down, and 45 degrees of bank. Well, there it is, 5% of the all attitude environment. That is where your core skills exist. Unless you come from being a military test pilot and spin certification or a military fighter pilot or you're an aerobatic pilot, is your core skill set lies in that box, okay? That's where you spend the vast majority of your time. Now, the good news is way back in your initial training, which could have been, you know, a few months ago or it could have been a few decades ago, depending on how long you've been a pilot, is you actually have some redundancy or a margin of safety. In your training, you did unusual attitudes all the way up to 30 degrees nose up, 30 degrees nose down, and up to 60 degrees of bank. That was the extent of your training. And that represents 11% of the all attitude environment. Now, it would be one thing if the skills we had in the blue and the yellow transferred out to the red, then the red would not be a threat. But the problem is, the further we get away from the blue and yellow regions, the more counterintuitive the skill set becomes to affect recovery from those actions. So can you see now why that criteria, that blue box of the airplane upset is critical for us to recognize? We only have a small margin of skills that we've experienced in our life, unless you've done dedicated upset training, that you can take effective action. You can't wait to the limits of your experience. You can't wait to 30 nose up. You can't wait to 60 degrees of bank because beyond that, your skill sets become more and more unreliable. Okay, so the stall spin escalation, remember the speed is also another area that we need to be aware of, not just pitch and bank. So when we talk about speed, very often we're referring to the angle of attack of the airplane. And when I'm talking about pushing, I'm talking about reducing angle of attack. As we take a look now here, which is a, a diagram of angle of attack versus the coefficient of lift, you can see that green section right up to the L over D max. That's the speed stable region or the, region or the normal operating region of our airplane. That's where we want to be. If we get into slow flight, which is now the yellow region, inappropriately, okay, that's an inappropriate airspeed, that's when we need to take effective action. We have the stall warning go off, that's where we have to take effective action. But the problem is, is that time and again, in over 50% of that big stack of loss control, or 50%, pilots not only miss slow flight and miss stall warning and miss the full stall recovery, but they now get stabilized and buried in the post-stall red zone where the airplane is not responding. It is out of control. They are no longer in control and they have to reduce angle of attack. So these are the threat areas. We talked about the pitch in the bank, okay, all right, we talked about those. Now we've talked about inappropriate airspeed, and as you can see, it's driven by angle of attack. These are our threat areas, okay? So remember your pitch and bank criteria, and remember, inadvertent slow flight is actually an airplane upset. Take corrective action there, okay? So remember those. Attitude upset, stall upset. We need to recognize when they happen and take effective action. Okay, so how do we defeat loss of control in flight? What do we want to do? We're now starting to talk about some tools that I want you to have as a pilot, okay? We've had the education, we've talked about uh, how we're susceptible, we understand threat and error management, but when you walk away from this briefing, how do you now become armed with information to keep you safe, okay? So, number one, we want you to keep the airplane in the heart of the envelope. What is the heart of the envelope? The airplane is in positive control. 
Okay, you're faster than L over D max speed. Remember, you're not in slow flight. You're in the speed stable region of your operating curve. You have less than 45 degrees of bank, less than 25 degrees nose up, less than 10 degrees nose down. Okay, so remember, your job is to recognize when any of these factors happen. Are you in control? Okay, are you in the speed stable region? And is your pitch and bank under control? Okay, because if you aren't, you got to stop. Okay, you see this handout here? I want you to remember that. Stop. Okay, whatever you are doing, you have to stop. If you're on approach, if you're on departure, if you're at altitude, if you're reading your magazine, whatever it might be, whatever you are doing now does not matter any more than you getting back in control of the airplane. So the first step on our strategy is going to be to stop and recognize what's going on and take effective action. Before this point, you are making small corrections as a pilot to mitigate the situation. Now you're in a situation where you have to intervene to take effective action. So remember that, hand up, stop is your first no. Okay, so here you are, you're telling me, well, you know, uh, BJ, I'm current, I know my airplane, I make good decisions. I can't be distracted. There's nothing. This isn't going to happen to me. I don't need training. I don't need better awareness. I don't need better education. Let's go ahead and take a look at an example of a video. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a video where I guarantee you that you, unless you've seen this before, I guarantee you, you will be distracted. Okay. And then we're going to talk about what kind of distraction this actually is. Okay. So watch this video. And I promise you, I guarantee you, you're going to be distracted. Let's watch it. To test just how much attention the attention-stealing design of the new Skoda Fabia actually steals, we left one parked on this ordinary road in West London. We wanted to see if its sharp crystalline shapes, bold lines and lower, wider profile would attract the desired level of attention. Will the 17-inch black alloy wheels stop passers-by in their tracks? Will the angular headlights attract the attention of other road users? Will a crowd gather to check out its fresh, sporty look? Well, not quite. But did the attention-stealing design distract you from noticing that the entire street has been changing right before your very eyes? Don't believe us? Have another look. Did you spot the van changing to a taxi? How about the scooter changing to a pair of bicycles? Or the lady holding a pig? let alone the fact that the entire street is now completely different. Didn't think so. So there we have it. Proof that the new Skoda Fabia is truly attention stealing. <laughs> what a great commercial. I wish we'd thought of that for our business somehow. Uh, but the most important thing to remember out of this video is this. We can be distracted. Okay, now there's, it's, that video is a good example and a bad example of distraction. Now, what do you think I mean by that? What I mean by that is if the blue car, if the blue car was what's matter, what matters, then we, were, we weren't distracted, right? Okay. The problem is, is when the blue car isn't what matters and all the things that can go on around us to put in a situation that we're not aware of until it's potentially too late or requires superior skills to intervene. Okay. So distraction is a major deal when it comes to loss of control and flight. We have to have discipline, we have to have airmanship, we have to be proficient, we have to understand our systems, because when there's things that we don't understand or are unusual, is that can be the blue car that takes us away from our cross-check, our instrumentation, whatever might be the most important aspect at that time, and we get drawn on that for just a few seconds. Well, how long does it take to get into a loss of control and flight event when the first criteria is met? Two to 12 seconds, right? 10 seconds to survive loss of control, how long can you be distracted? The most important thing is, is number one, don't be distracted. But if you are, it can be in a situation where the scenario is beyond your awareness and skill. You need to have training.